Um, thank you all for coming to today's uh, uh, Grand Rounds in Row Green Lecture. Um, today, so for those who don't know, my name is Harrison. I'm one of the chief residents. Um, and uh, to introduce our speaker, I'd like to invite up Dr. Salata. My greetings as well. It's good to see you all here. So um, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank Ro Green for her enduring support uh, to uh, us. And in fact, uh, we are working on another joint gift with both the university and UH uh, for uh, the building, a uh, building in Kampala, Uganda, where we've been present now for over 33 years, working on 34. Uh, this is our fourth lecture as part of this series for the Rogue Green Global Center I mean, uh, and uh, Travel Medicine. Today, uh, Chris Longenecker, an old friend of ours, is back. Uh, Chris is currently um, at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where he went uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, and uh, he is the, uh, he's an associate professor of medicine there and the director of the Global uh, Cardiovascular Health Program. And he'll tell us a little bit more about that known Chris since he was a fellow here at, at, at UH. He came via Ohio State as his School of Medicine and thereafter did his residency at UCSF and then joined us here uh, for fellowship and was an attending for years. But he and his wife had great opportunities in, in Washington, the state of Washington. And uh, as you'll hear, things are just uh, uh, exceedingly successful there for him. Um, so he was the founding member, uh, founding um, leader of their Department of Global Health and Cardiovascular Medicine. This is jointly um, involves uh, cardiovascular medicine and the global health area at the University of Washington. He has uh, been very successful in terms of funding, both from the NIH and um, the uh, heart societies. Uh, and uh, he is uh, really here with a focus uh, as well on the care of HIV-infected individuals with cardiovascular disease, which is a growing, uh, ever-growing problem. So with that in mind, Chris, uh, please join us uh, in giving this lecture. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Bob, and I want to just make sure everyone can hear me on Zoom. Um, so it's really a great pleasure to be back here today at Case and UH uh, to give this, this lecture. And uh, for those of you who want to get in touch with me, um, let me make sure that this is going to work. You can uh, reach me at my Twitter handle, at HIV Cardiodoc, or uh, my email address there. Um, at University of Washington. I want to acknowledge Ro Green, and uh, really it's, it's a privilege to give this lecture, and I want to thank you for all that you have done for the uh, university hospital's mission to improve human health around the world through outreach and education. And I also want to acknowledge that, you know, I learned something last night uh, about your father who really introduced you to travel and the importance of travel around the world, and he said, the nicest thing about travel is coming home. So today is going to be a little bit about that. It's about taking what we've learned in global health and bringing it home. I have no disclosures. And of course, we have some objectives since this is a CME event. So you can read them there um, and you'll hopefully learn something and hopefully be inspired. So here is the outline for today. We're going to first talk about what the heck is reciprocal innovation. And then I'm going to give you three examples of my work uh, from uh, here in Cleveland, uh, the Extra CVD project, as well as in Uganda, Palesa, Uganda. Both of those projects are trying to improve cardiovascular disease prevention care for people living with HIV. And then I'm going to venture into something that's not HIV related, uh, the DOT heart failure project, which is a digital toolkit for systolic heart failure. 
and then talk about the next frontier for me in reciprocal innovation, which is really a leveraging all of the work and, and networks of the University of Washington in the Mountain West region, and talk a little bit about methamphetamine cardiomyopathy, which you may not know about here in Cleveland, because it's just not as much of a problem. So uh, along the way, I'll share some beautiful pictures because the Pacific Northwest is a beautiful place to live. This is the North Cascades uh, National Park. Um, very, very nice place to get out in nature. So what is reciprocal innovation? This is a term coined by the University of Indiana Global Health Group, uh, led by this publication in uh, Global Pu Public Health by Soares and Company. So they describe reciprocal innovation as the bidirectional, co-constituted, and iterative exchange of ideas, resources, and innovations to address shared health challenges across diverse global settings through, by delivering a solution through co-development and exchange of information. So this is the basis of what I'm gonna talk about today, but let's go into a little bit more detail. So at the end of the day, I think all of us recognize that there may be very similar circumstances shared by a young woman who's living with rheumatic heart disease in Uganda, a homeless army vet who may be suffering from a substance use disorder in rural Kentucky, uh, an Indian American woman suffering from systolic heart failure in Montana, or a South African man living with HIV and comorbidities of aging. And some of those shared challenges include things like just transportation to clinic in rural areas. We deal with this all the time in Uganda. It's also a big problem in Idaho and Montana. Um, other issues, lack of trust in the health system, that sort of thing. I think there are things that we can learn from one context which may be applicable in another context. This term reciprocal innovation builds on a concept of reverse innovation that was popularized in, in, over the last you know, 10 to 20 years as the concept that something that develops in a low-income country may actually be able to achieve um, really high adoption and spread in high-income countries, particularly things that are low cost, right? And these frugal innovations was a lot of what people were focused on. But the term reverse innovation implies that innovation should be flowing in one direction. Innovation should be flowing from high-income countries to low-income countries. And I don't think that's correct. I think that, in fact, there's many reasons to believe why innovation could flow in both directions. So reciprocal innovation is a much more equitable and appropriate term. There are many examples of this uh, kind of reverse or reciprocal innovation coming from low-income countries of the world, uh, such as the GE um, model of an EKG machine shown here, which was initially developed in India and now has achieved widespread use throughout the high-income countries. Um, Ushahidi is a, a platform that was used to crowdsource data during disasters in Kenya and in Haiti, and then got used in uh, the Gulf Coast during uh, hurricane disasters. And Partners in Health has, has been working in Haiti for a long time uh, to, to really deliver close to client, client models of care and are now doing that in Boston um, to improve care in the United States. If you're interested, there's a really great resource that's available online that I'd highly recommend. Um, this Global Learning for U.S. Primary Healthcare from a, uh, an organization called Global to Local, or G2L, um, actually led by a guy from Seattle, um, Dr. Sugarman, and he takes you through a, a step, uh, three-step process of incorporating the global perspective, exploring global ideas, and adapting and implementing global solutions. How do we do this? They, the guide is very practical. And in fact, um, Bhattacharya and colleagues have described a way of trying to think about what innovations in low and middle income country settings may actually be valuable and have potential for spread in a high income country setting. And they proposed after meeting and doing a modified Delphi process for uh, kind of deciding on these things that first in a step one, it's important to evaluate whether this is actually a successful innovation in the low income country, whether it's accessible, cost effective, effective and scalable. And then if it is, then stepping back and saying, what is the potential in a high income country? Is there a gap that it targets? 
Is there compatibility with the high income country health system? Novelty, and is there some degree of receptivity of receiving that innovation uh, in the high income country? And uh, so we have applied this to some of the, the work that we do. Once you decide that there's an opportunity for reciprocal innovation, it's important to think about how to do that strategically. And this designing for diffusion model as proposed by Deering and colleagues at uh, Michigan State uh, is just one, one way of going about that. So for those of you who are interested, I'd encourage you to learn more. In particular, it's really important that there be a linking agent. And this is where I think um, universities and academic medical centers will play a role because they are seeing these uh, innovations in their work, in the global health work, and they also may know what particular organizations could be potential partners for scaling that in the United States. So I think that reciprocal innovation importantly goes both ways. And if you're not gonna use the term reverse, how might you describe the directionality? And I propose that we use afferent and efferent, like in neurology, right? So from the perspective of the United States, afferent reciprocal innovation is stuff that's coming from uh, LMIC or global health context back to the United States. But we also have plenty of cool stuff that we do in urban, low resource settings in the United States which may be actually applicable to our global health work. And we should be learning both ways. We should be exporting our own innovations as well. So with that introduction on reciprocal innovation, let's talk about some of um, my work over the years and how that um, kind of illustrates reciprocal innovation. So um, first to get everyone on the same page about implementation science, I think this is something that some people know about, others less so but it's part of the spectrum of translational science. And some of you have seen uh, this sort of um, kind of scheme of thinking about translation. T0 is discovery science, basic science, you know, in mice and figuring out how biology works. And then T1 is early stage translation, doing those first human studies, leading to T2 clinical trials of drugs and other strategies in humans. And then eventually later stages of translational science to make sure that it has a population level impact. And when I think about global health, I think those early stages of translational science are relatively less important than late stage population health and really implementation science, which I'm going to define in the next slide. Implementation science is classically described as the science of trying to figure out how to bridge the no-do gap. What do I mean by that? Well, we have a lot of evidence of what we know works. We have clinical trials that show X drug works in Y population, but in clinical practice, it doesn't happen a lot of times. And we all know that as clinicians, especially we know that that's not happening. So how do we scientifically study the best way to bridge that no-do gap? But once we figure out some strategies, implementation strategies to do that in one context, let's say with the extra CBD study here at university hospitals, how do we then scale it to make implementation really um, at a larger level? And when you talk about scaling anything, you can talk about scaling up, just simply getting more people, getting the practice to affect more people or scaling out to go to different populations. So I think getting more and getting different types of people uh, to experience that um, intervention is, is kind of what we're talking about. So I'm gonna now talk about the extra CVD study and the Polesa trial. Um, the extra CVD study, the full title is a nurse-led intervention to extend the HIV treatment cascade for cardiovascular disease prevention or extra CVD. The Palesa study is strengthening the blood pressure care and treatment cascade for Ugandans living with HIV, implementation strategies to save lives. The extra CVD study is a U01 funded by NHLBI. It began in 2018 and is now in a no cost extension phase. Excited to share a little bit more about that. And then Palesa is a cluster randomized trial that's a UG3, UH3 mechanism where we had some formative work first and we're now just ready to start the, or we just started in February, um, the randomized trial, which I'll talk about. There are many key elements of reciprocal innovation 
but I'm going to talk specifically about this concept of task sharing or task, task shifting, which many of you have heard about using nurses um, as a way to kind of bolster cardiovascular disease prevention care. Um, both projects use a human-centered design approach to figuring out the best implementation strategy for the context. And then both studies also have used remote patient monitoring to some degree, home blood pressure monitoring being the key one uh, that I'll talk about. I've been uh, crusading for some time about this idea that for HIV care, especially in the United States, but also in Africa, we have done a really pretty good job, even though we may not be at our 95, 95, 95 targets, we've done a good job of diagnosing HIV, still work to go, but done a good job prescribing antiretroviral therapy to those who have HIV and having our patients take the meds as prescribed to achieve suppression of the virus in the blood. So as many of you who work in HIV clinics know, we, we have a lot of patients who have achieved that final stage of the HIV treatment cascade. So at that point, it's important to turn your attention towards the prevention of non-AIDS comorbidities. In this case, ASCVD, with the, which is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, mainly focusing on high blood pressure and high cholesterol. They need to be appropriately diagnosed, appropriately managed, and then the meds need to be titrated to goal to achieve blood pressure and cholesterol goals. So let's talk about extra CVD. And I want to acknowledge the afferent reciprocal innovation that was very much part of the original idea. And our colleague, Dr. Rajesh Vedanthan from NYU, who's the director in the section for global health, had a number of studies using nurses in East Africa and Western Kenya to deliver hypertension care. And that very much informed the um, strategy that we came up with as an initial uh, strategy for extra CVD. This is a collaboration of multiple institutions you see here together as a cooperative ward with the NHLBI. So the performance sites being uh, university hospitals, the SIU, Metro Health across town, and Duke Health uh, in North Carolina. It's also part of a larger consortium of projects within the uh, NHLBI um, that are all focused on improving heart, lung, and blood disease care among people living with HIV. Our initial work was to say, let's figure out what the uh, barriers and facilitators of cardiovascular disease prevention care are in the three academic medical centers where we're going to do this study so that we can tailor and adapt our strategy to those contexts. And we conducted focus groups and semi-structured interviews among 51 people living with HIV and 34 healthcare providers to ask the question, what are the constraints on and opportunities for integrated cardiovascular disease prevention care for people living with HIV. We uh, came up with a number of uh, interesting facilitators and barriers as part of this research. Um, you can read them there, but I'd like to point out on the facilitator side of things, there actually is really a, ro a robust uh, support, financial support for HIV clinics in the United States through the Ryan White Act that I think allows us to do some interesting work in HIV clinics that you may not be able to do in regular primary care. Um, I also think that um, our patients are, who are living with HIV infection understand the value of self-monitoring. They're, they're uh, kind of trained to know their numbers, their CD4 count and the viral load. So they may also be trained to know what is my blood pressure target? What is my cholesterol target? But there are barriers as well with all this funding for extra social workers and you know, dietitian, et cetera. Like when patients come to clinic, everyone wants to see them and there are bottlenecks in clinic flow. There are always problems with transportation, but there's also this barrier in, in HIV clinics in the United States, which is that patients trust their HIV provider, which is great, that's a facilitator, but if their HIV provider is not providing comprehensive primary care and they also have to see a primary care doc outside, then there's this um, kind of, difficulty with care coordination and who's taking responsibility for the blood pressure and cholesterol. Okay, so with that formative work, we then entered into a phase where we engaged stakeholders, patients, providers, uh, nurses, social workers, and went through a human-centered design process. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the next slide as well. But essentially, we brainstormed ideas for what we could do to address blood pressure and cholesterol care, 
kind of conceptualized them, created some strategies, had a little pilot test, and further iterated it, tested for acceptability and feasibility. And it's a very, very iterative process led by an uh, extra CBD diversity supplement awardee, Dr. Angela Afa from NYU. And uh, I really like this process. I think it's um, very uh, popular in, in kind of the, the design world and thinking about designing products that people will actually use. So if you're gonna design a strategy to improve things in your clinic, you want to make sure that the end users are actually going to implement it. So uh, it's really an iterative process of diverging and converging and diverging again uh, to find a solution that works. It's a process that involves a lot of sticky notes and it's really interactive and fun. And so um, if you're interested in learning more, there are plenty of resources out there on human-centered design. So we ultimately came up with a four, uh, four strategies to um, try to improve uh, blood pressure and cholesterol care in the clinic. Um, the first was to insert a nurse into the care of uh, these patients with high blood pressure and high cholesterol and have that nurse do a, a care coordination between primary care docs and HIV docs. Um, to have those nurses equipped with the knowledge of uh, evidence-based medication protocols um, and you know, helping to get clinicians to kind of overcome clinical inertia. Home blood pressure monitoring was a key piece of this. And then finally, some electronic medical record support tools that are relatively minor. We tested this strategy in a randomized clinical trial of 300 participants, people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy with HIV-1 viral load less than 200 with hypertension and cholesterol. Again, they had to have both conditions. They were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive this intervention versus the control, which was just basically coming every four months for some generic prevention education. Again, stratified by site, the three sites, Metro, UH, and Duke. The uh, follow-up was 12 months, uh, four time periods, and the primary outcome was change in systolic blood pressure, secondary outcome, change in non-HDL cholesterol. This is what we call a hybrid type one design, meaning an implementation effectiveness hybrid design where we not only were concerned about effectiveness, but also curious about what were the determinants of implementation, like what, you know, caused someone, a provider, to be more or less responsive to the nurse's recommendations, for example, right? Part of that is uh, looking at provider trust and communication. And so we had surveys that our uh, participants did where they describe um, how well they trust and communicate with their various providers. And the hope was that by inserting a nurse into that care team, we might be able to improve uh, the communication and trust uh, amongst those providers. We uh, are a trial that was funded pre-COVID and started enrolling pre-COVID. So we have, we have a very interesting data set of participants who were you know, before COVID, during early COVID, and then during the late COVID period. And we were able to then compete successfully for a supplement award in May of 2020, just two months after like kind of everything broke loose uh, to get additional funding uh, to study the factors, the intrapersonal, such as stress and loneliness, interpersonal, such as social isolation, emotional support, and community factors such as the larger healthcare financing system and telemedicine that were affecting cardiovascular disease care during the pandemic for our patients. And in an initial, again, formative phase where we did uh, interviews, um, we then went back to our design team and re-engaged them and said, how can we adapt to the COVID world? Uh, and so we created a virtual adaptation uh, where the nurse is using Zoom to really um, like watch patients take their blood pressure at home, making sure they're doing it correctly um, and that sort of thing. So we have a clinical trial of that adapted intervention, which is a single arm in addition to the 300 in the overall study. Um, so I'm happy to say that we now have some preliminary results that are positive, but uh, uh, we're planning to submit them to the uh, American Heart Association scientific sessions as a late breaking clinical trial. So I don't want to present them here today, but I look forward to presenting them uh, once they are uh, publicly available. So now let's move on. We're going to talk now about the strengthening the blood pressure care and treatment cascade for Ugandans living with HIV. This is also part of a consortium. Um, 
the uh, NHLBI was concerned not only improving heart, lung, and blood disease care in the United States, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa, where the majority of people living with HIV live. So there are six projects, the US and the um, African institutions shown there. Um, our project in Uganda um, is a collaboration of the Infectious Disease Research uh, Collaboration um, and CASE, UW, Yale, RTI International, and uh, important Uganda stakeholders such as Macquarie University, the Uganda Heart Institute, and the Uganda Ministry of Health. The project is being conducted in Kampala and the neighboring Wakiso district. Um, and th so this is urban and peri-urban Uganda. It's not rural Uganda, which is a different uh, scenario, but we wanted to focus first on urban Uganda. Again, the formula is the same, a formative assessment to figure out what's going on, a human-centered design process of adapting an intervention, and then testing that in a trial. So during this formative assessment, we were curious, what is actually happening in terms of blood pressure measurement, management, and monitoring within these HIV clinics within uh, the Kampala and Wakiso? And in fact, very, um, very little was happening in blood pressure uh, in many of the clinics. Some of the clinics were doing much more than others. But we also wanted to engage people in asking the question, what are you doing in HIV care that's innovative and maybe could be translated to the care of people with, uh, of your patients with hypertension? Um, and then again, using a human-centered design approach, we took some of these early uh, findings and um, strategized about what might work. Part of human-centered design is empathizing with the end user. And so this is what's called an empathy map. Um, again, a lot of sticky notes where you try to get into the shoes of what is a patient actually experiencing when they go to clinic? Um, what are they hearing, thinking and feeling, seeing? What are the pain and gain points? And we did this both for uh, patients, but also for providers because this intervention ultimately was happening at both levels. Again, one of the things that came out of, of HIV care in Africa is a concept called differentiated service delivery. And this is um, very important in helping uh, HIV uh, programs in Africa provide efficient care. The idea at, at centrally is that for complex and unstable patients, they need more care. So facility-based care, maybe more frequent care but stable clients, they don't need to be coming back every three months for CD4 count and viral load. Maybe they can come back less frequently. Maybe they don't have to come back to get their drugs at the HIV clinic. Maybe they can get them from a community drug distribution point. So we asked the question, how can we uh, harmonize hypertension care into that model of differentiated service delivery by focusing primarily, the, the design team thought, primarily on community drug distribution points and multi-month prescriptions to match prescriptions of blood pressure medicines with prescriptions of antiretroviral therapy. So we developed then two implementation strategies that we'll be testing in a cluster randomized trial. The first strategy, which came out of <laughs> clearly came out of the, the formative assessment was that there were supply chain issues, particularly with the medicines. So we said, okay, we will provide the medicines free of charge, and we will make sure that there are blood pressure machines available for the clinic, and we will get rid of that problem. And if we just do that, along with some basic training in hypertension care, how much can we improve the hypertension care cascade just with that? On top of that, then we said, okay, let's do another strategy, a more human resource intensive strategy, where we do more intensive training, not just at the beginning, but ongoing, where we can do some one-on-one -on -one coaching if um, an HIV doc or, or an HIV a uh, nurse who's uh, you know, trying to manage patients has a question, they can call an advice line and get some help. Differentiated service delivery, which we just talked about. And then remote patient monitoring, figuring out how to do home blood pressure monitoring or how to do blood pressure monitoring in the community uh, in Uganda. Um, and then finally, a performance improvement program where we would give uh, the clinics back their data on how their hypertension cascade is looking and talk with them about how to improve this is a kind of an audit and feedback uh, strategy, very common in implementation science. So the trial then is a cluster randomized trial, 16 clinics that are rolled out two at a time, one to the hypertension basic strategy and one to the hypertension plus strategy. 
And then um, by the end of the um, you know, first year or so, all the clinics will be going and it's about a two and a half year um, total duration of the trial. We're looking at costs and cost effectiveness because while the basic strategy may not be quite as effective as all of those other things, the hypertension plus strategy, it may actually be cheaper. And so maybe it's more cost effective. So that's ultimately at the end of the day, what ministries of health want to know. So let's, let's talk about something totally different from HIV, which is systolic heart failure or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And for that, we're going to take a, a step into a digital health world. Um, and to, uh, as a way of kind of some, some preliminary uh, background information, um, I think many in the room recognize that we do a really bad job of getting our patients onto guideline-based treatment of heart failure, what we call GDMT, guideline-directed medical therapy. And these are the classes of drugs that we know work that have really, really significant benefits in reducing mortality and heart failure hospitalization, um, but actually uh, we don't um, uh, see it uh, happen. All right, sorry, sorry about the little diversion there. Um, so um, as I was saying, uh, we do a poor job of, um, let me just make sure, yep. We do a poor job of getting patients on these drugs. Um, and so how can we do better? And Implement HF was a clinical trial presented at ACC and published in JAK this year that, that had a virtual care team consulting on these patients in the hospital, telling the, the team, oh, I think you need to uptight the beta block or the ACE inhibitor. And it actually resulted in some certainly new initiations and intensifications of treatment. But at the end of the day, it was a relatively minor bump in improvement. And that's great, but obviously patients are discharged from the hospital. And so how can we improve this after discharge? There are two clinical trials um, that have tried to do this, strong heart failure and EPIC uh, HF. Uh, some uh, may be familiar with strong HF presented at the AHA earlier this year or ESC. Uh, that was really, really uh, effective, but really in high intensity of care. And both of these strategies were relatively um, high resource intensity strategies. Um, so how do we do this maybe with a little uh, less human resources? And so we currently have a collaborative effort of the American Heart Association's Health Technology and Innovation Strategically Focused Research Network that is working together to try to create a digital optimization toolkit for management of heart failure after discharge. Focusing on a patient engagement app, remote patient monitoring tools, and a clinician facing dashboard as the three key components. And we're testing this in the United States, mainly in academic medical centers. But we as the Cincinnati Children's Group, who is doing it, where I'm part of a rheumatic heart disease project they're doing in Uganda, we were the international group. And so our task was to find an international partner to maybe test this strategy. And our partner is Brazil. And, and so we're going to be testing this strategy using um, a less expensive remote patient monitoring solution in the Brazil public health system at the Federal University of Minas Gerais. This is just an example of what uh, the patient app looks like. And we're trying to gamify it a little bit to incentivize patients to engage. Obviously, there are technology hurdles that we have to address, but we hope that some patients will really like this. We similarly used a human-centered design approach, uh, this time at Hopkins. Uh, they were very into this and led by um, Aaron Spaulding at the School of Nursing. So uh, we took uh, that um, basic intervention at, that came out of the human-centered design process uh, at Hopkins, and are now further iterating it in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. Some of you in the audience may know that um, Marco Costa uh, is from this area of Brazil, um, our former uh, chief of cardiology and president of the Heart Institute. Um, he was the one who actually connected us to our colleagues in Brazil, Dr. Luisa Brandt and Tom Ribeiro, many, many years ago. And we've been doing rheumatic heart disease work with them. So that's now led to this uh, systolic heart failure project. Um, so again, more sticky notes, human-centered design process in Brazil, and we are in the process of getting that IRB approved for a pilot trial in Brazil. Um, whoop, 
I like this one, right? So many sticky notes. <laughs> so um, if you're interested, can can talk more about that. But um, adapting to context um, is important. And so Brazil is obviously not going to be the same as academic medical centers. And you can see here, just from some baseline medicine use, um, in the public health system, very low rates of Entresto and SGLT2 inhibitors because the, of the cost. But actually, they do a really good job of putting people on MRAs, drugs like spironolactone or plerinone. So how can we improve, help them do better as well? So there's this concept that I talked about, efferens, uh, reciprocal innovation. But now we're interested in thinking about how do we bring that back to the United States? And maybe the low-cost intervention developed in Brazil may be applicable in some parts of the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Dr. Adia Jafari, an internal medicine resident at University of Washington, is currently in Brazil, learning as much as she can about their program so that she can come back. And she's from Boise, Idaho, and has done work in rural Idaho. So very, very um, well positioned to do this sort of work. So what is the next frontier? So first of all, another beautiful picture of the Pacific Northwest. I love to get out on the water. So I think that there are multiple axes of reciprocal innovation. These are just three others. So global to local, that's what we've been talking about. But I think urban to rural, there are things that we do in urban settings that I think may be applicable to rural and vice versa. Practice to academia. Obviously, a lot of what we do in academic medical centers doesn't translate very well, but maybe there are some lessons that would translate to, to community practice. And so we've proposed um, um, a uh, network um, that may or may not be funded, but we hope that parts of it will eventually be funded uh, to do this sort of reciprocal innovation um, across rural America. I'll, I'm gonna just give you two examples. This first one is a global to local reciprocal innovation incubator in the rural Mountain West. And um, in particular, AIM2 there with the University of Idaho is that heart failure demonstration project but also interested in working with Montana State to think about um, taking differentiated service delivery, which I've talked a lot about in Africa. And this is just, again, an example of figuring out what kind of services are needed, when, where, and delivered by whom um, in, in Africa for HIV care, and then taking that to cardiovascular disease care in the rural Mountain West in Montana, what is the best what is the most important risk factor to focus on? Blood pressure, cholesterol, that sort of thing. Where to do it? Maybe it's um, uh, the home, maybe it's churches. We know um, that black barber shops in, use in, in Los Angeles are very effective places to do blood pressure management. We know that from US urban uh, trials. So what is, the, what is the barber shop of the rural uh, mountain west? Um, who should be doing it, pharmacists, physicians, nurses, et cetera. So that's one project. And then the last one I'll, I'll share is methamphetamine heart failure. So this was one of the biggest shocks clinically to me when I moved from Cleveland to Seattle. You can see here the um, prevalence of uh, methamphetamine-associated heart failure hospitalizations per 1,000 heart failure hospitalizations on the West Coast compared to the East. And it's like 50, 60, 70 times greater than many parts of the East Coast. And it's a very, very difficult condition to treat when someone is also having a substance use disorder. So we're, our idea is to, uh, with colleagues at Oregon Health and Sciences University who have developed a peer intervention mostly in urban settings in Portland and uh, urban Oregon, um, to go out to uh, communities and screen for heart failure and early heart failure with BNP, uh, this comes from, this is evidence-based. Um, so uh, it's actually a two-way recommendation in the heart failure guidelines um, that high-risk populations can be screened with BNP uh, and then with a team-based approach, um, kind of trying to, to prevent heart failure. And so uh, this is our strategy. After screening patients, those who screen positive with a high BNP um, are then randomized to receive a peer-facilitated connection to a telehealth cardiology program with the urban-based uh, Portland Oregon Health and Sciences University versus a peer-facilitated connection 
to local care uh, in, in the rural community. So again, a very interesting kind of urban to rural reciprocal innovation loop. So in conclusion, I'd like to end um, by saying and proposing that I really think that reciprocal innovation is what we need right now in this time of social isolation, social fracturing and division that we see in this country that certainly predated COVID, but has been exacerbated by the pandemic. You know, fueled by um, social media and our silos and Twitter, et cetera, and the political divisions that we see between uh, urban blue counties and red rural ones. And I think that projects like these, um, these reciprocal innovation projects that bring together people from very seemingly different contexts may have some potential in some small way uh, to bridge the, those divides. Um, so I hope that some of you in the audience are interested in continuing to do this work in your careers. If you're interested in global health, I'd highly encourage you to think about how does what your work in global health have to do with how we can improve things here uh, in the United States. And so with that, I'd like to thank many, many people involved in this work from the University of Washington, from Case, from Duke, Cincinnati Children's, Macquarie University, the Ministry of Health in Uganda, Yale, RTI, Federal University of Minas Gerais, Stanford, Hopkins, Michigan, and Oregon Health Sciences, and the funders, of course, and particularly the patients that uh, have participated in our studies. And so thank you very much. It's been an honor here uh, to be uh, part of this Rogue Green lecture uh, and happy to take some questions. Thank you, Chris. <clears throat> that was very inspiring and really an example of what uh, should be the way forward. Can you comment on, you mentioned COVID several times, uh, and we know that it has long-term effects on cardiovascular health. <clears throat> but uh, how has this been disproportionately seen in HIV-infected individuals? Can you have a few thoughts about that? Yeah, thank you, Bob, for that question. Um, you know, in my clinical practice, uh, we haven't seen that, that there's a, a particular risk for the cardiovascular complications of COVID that is clinically extremely relevant. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there are groups that are looking at this. Matt Durstenfeld is um, a friend of mine at UCSF who's done a study of long COVID um, and seeing that there certainly is maybe some, some uh, chronotropic incompetence that's seen in people living with HIV who have long COVID. Um, and he's exploring that further. Um, but uh, what I would say is it's actually not as much as you may, may think. One other question relates to uh, the African setting again, where uh, specialized HIV care clinics have been set up and uh, actually a place where research can be done. And how do, how do you use those with regard to other uh, non-communicable diseases? I know you have in your own experience with rheumatic heart disease. Can you comment on that, please? Yeah, so the project I described, the Palacio Uganda project, is trying to improve NCD care, hypertension care for people living with HIV. But what about people without HIV? Right, our HIV care systems in Africa work pretty well because of all the funding that exists there for HIV. So I, I absolutely agree that I think that there is maybe some reciprocal learnings that could happen between the HIV community and the other, you know, general health system um, in terms of hypertension care, um, and that's happening actually as part of this network of the HLB Simple Alliance. There are many uh, people who have really have never been part of the HIV research community who uh, submitted grants to do this and they're hypertension experts. So you've got HIV experts and hypertension experts working together. And again, part of innovation is that um, innovation is often taking something that is really well known in one field and bringing it to a new field and then it becomes an innovation, right? And so the more kind of crosstalk that you have, I think the better. So, you know, for for this problem in particular in Africa, um, I think having the hypertension experts and the HIV docs interacting is, has been beneficial. 
Other comments or questions? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Robbins, for that uh, presentation. Can you speak to what are some of the barriers and um, the way to which we uh, commercial barriers to that e fair innovation um, back to the back to the US? So um I think it depends on the context in the US. And I think in particular, global health is often working with, you're working with very few resources, right? And so it's probably gonna be low resource settings of the US, but a low resource setting in an urban context is different from a low resource setting in a rural context. So I think uh, it depends. Um, I think that, um, that remote monitoring, digital tools are ways that you can work to bridge that um, distance problem, transportation to clinic. This is a huge problem for our rheumatic heart disease patients in really the northern parts of Uganda that used to have to travel so, such long distances to come to Kampala for care. But now through telehealth, we've been able to establish programs in Gulu to take care of those patients. Similarly, in rural United States, how do we te do telemedicine in the right way that kind of combines some degree of a trusted local source like those peers in the methamphetamine um, intervention with some experts at a distant site, right? So uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. There are some, some questions in the chat yeah. as well. I have a couple of people who like. <clears throat> so uh, the question is, what type of health system is in Uganda? Is it like US fragmented broken health systems? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, and um, any information from developing countries, uh, developed countries uh, with universal health care for all citizens? Wow, yeah, so there's a lot packed in that question. What I would like to focus on, though, is um, kind of the issue of trust in the health system. So um, if you think that people don't trust the health system in the United States, um, you should visit Uganda, uh, where um, it's there's very little trust in the health system, partly because there are a few resources to deal with when you go to the hospital, right? And so people have learned by experience that not much may get done. Um, and so how do you deal with that trust problem? Um, in HIV care in Africa, there's been a lot of innovation and in, again, differentiated service delivery models for providing care in pharmacies, right? So a local pharmacy where someone you know, can go, they may know that person, um, and there may be less stigma because it's not an HIV clinic. Um, they may go to that to, um, interestingly, I saw it twice, some presentations on salons where women in South Africa go to the salon for their pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, but they also get a bunch of wraparound services and contraception and STD care. And so, um, but they trust their, you know, their salon stylist, right? And so, um, that's how you may be able to overcome that trust issue. So again, similarly in the United States, the black barbershop model of hypertension care is a great example of how do you overcome um, kind of some of those trust issues. Um, and I think, you know, it's not fixing the system, but it's developing innovative strategies to work within it. Any other questions, comments? Um, you, we were talking earlier, Chris, about uh, your experience in Washington, as opposed to when you worked in the special immunology clinic here. We have several of our nurses who are spectacular, and I want to uh, really uh, congratulate them. But can you talk about the SIU experience, uh, which is really a, a medical home, and how that really has facilitated much of this approach? Yeah, so um, I really enjoyed my time working in the special immunology unit here. Um, which is a model of care uh, that really empowers nurses to help uh, coordinate care and manage uh, many of the patients. Um, and they're really the first point of contact with patients. Um, that we don't have that sort of system at uh, the University of Washington, Madison Clinic, where I work. There are many th great things about Madison Clinic, but I really liked that about, um, about the special immunology unit. And what we're gonna find with the extra CVD trial without getting into too much of the details is that I think that there's differences between university hospitals and Metro Health and Duke, very important differences that may determine the effectiveness of this nurse-led strategy. 
Um, and it'll be interesting to dig into that. A lot of implementation science is not only saying, okay, this intervention works or this strategy works, but if it doesn't work, why doesn't it work? And if it does work, why does it work? What are the key factors of implementation that, that determine that? So excited to get into that. Uh, Thank you. Are, are there any other comments or questions? Yes, please. Thank you. Please. Thank you for the talk. Um, you get so I'm just thinking about your first slide that where you presented the different individuals with different backgrounds and how they share commonalities. And thinking about your move to Seattle, where you're working in the Pacific Northwest with the bombing states, and there's a lot of Native American um, yeah. and Indian Health Service uh, in a hospital out there. Is there a thought or even um, maybe some initiative to bring some of this nurse driven and bi directional approach to our own domestic services? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a really unique um, fellowship opportunity for anyone who is interested. It's called the Global and Rural Health Fellowship. So um, uh, after your internal medicine training, you go and you work for a year on um, an Indian Health Service site, either at the Pine Ridge site in South Dakota or the Alaska Native Medical Center in Alaska. And then in your second year, you get to do a global health project, um, uh, working with uh, any mentor, but typically a UW mentor um, in some global health setting around the world. Um, some people actually actually choose to stay and do, do it um, on, on the IHS site. Uh, so I think that's a great opportunity. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of funded projects right now that are doing that, but um, that's what I'm interested in, in, in getting funded. So um, I, I, I hope that in three or four years, I can come back and say that, yes, there are funded projects in that, in that space. We'll stay in touch with Chris in that uh, he is part of our external advisory board for the Rogue Green Center. Uh, so we'll stay in touch and uh, understand the progress that he's making. And it's really very interesting to think in these ways. But we have much to do, not only in terms of our international work, but also here at home. I think that's the other uh, important message. Are there any other last points? Otherwise, thank you for attending today. And uh, we'll see you soon.